uncharted territory for anybody on the mountain. Nobody's ever gone under the sevens. <laughs> Take a bow, Greg Murphy. That was something very special in the history of Bathurst. The year is 2003, and Australian supercar fans have just witnessed history. New Zealand driver Greg Murphy has just logged his lap of the gods. It is a moment motorsports fans across the world know. The video itself has nearly 2 million views on YouTube. And by this time every year, when the annual Bathurst 1000 takes place, it is played in celebration. But how did this happen? What is Australian supercars? And who is Greg Murphy? What is the lap of the gods? To start, let's answer the question. What is Australian supercars? Well, he sliced down the inside. Now they're side by side through the left hander at 10. How do they resolve this? Is there space given? There's only a couple of oh, fouls. He's touched. They've touched it. He let it. Oh. And Van Gisbergen lifts the throttle and gives him a breather. Oh, here we go. Down to turn four. Did he get him here? He's going to slide into it side by side. And they're going to drag right oh. up there. They continue the argument. Comes it to one line. Groove oh, down through oh. the dipper and on the run towards the elbow. This is off the scale, off the scale as Wind Cup does everything he can. He had a three second margin, he walks down the inside because he can. He comes away, and another way, and Boston goes through on the inside. This is huge in Australian motorsport. And watch this, look at these guys. It's on. It's Murphy on. and Ambrose, these two do not like each other, and they are going to have some serious words. Look at this. Two heated men. They are two heated competitors. Can you believe this Super G Auto 1000? In terms of actual history, Australian supercars are a relatively new series. The current supercar championship itself was founded in 1999, but supercars themselves date back to the 60s. The first nine years of the series determined its champion by only one race. That one race was being held at various tracks over the years, but in 1969, the circuit expanded to five races. Since then, it has grown into the top racing series in Australia, and it's been birthing names like Scott McLaughlin, Jamie Wincup, Marcus Ambrose, Mark Skyf, Dick Johnson, and of course, the aforementioned Greg Murphy. There are various others I didn't even mention that have also built their name in the Australian supercars. The commonality between all these drivers to establish themselves as a star is to win the circuit's biggest event, the Bathurst 1000. The Bathurst 1000, or as many locals refer to it as, quote, the Great Race, is a yearly test of Aussie grit, a 1,000 kilometer race at possibly the most challenging road circuit in the world. The race was originally called the Armstrong 500, a 500 mile race around the Phillips Island Grand Prix circuit. But in 1963, it was moved to where it is today, and it hasn't changed since. It has since 2001 been run on New South Wales' Labor Day, usually the second week in October. The first year they decided to run it as a 1,000 km event instead of a 500 mile event was in 1973. It coincided with faster cars and the Australian conversion to the inferior metric system. It was the first year of the Group C car, and in 1985 the series moved to the Group A car, and by the 21st century it was officially on the supercar circuit. The winner of the event each year receives the Peter Brock Trophy, an award in tribute to the greatest driver in the history of the event. During Brock's driving career he was nicknamed King of the Mountain, for his ability and dominance of the fabled Mount Panorama Road Course. Mount Panorama, probably one of the most intimidating racetracks in the world. The track itself consists of 23 corners, all named distinctly. Besides the addition of a chicane in the last straight before returning onto the front stretch, the track has remained relatively unchanged for over 80 years. The mountain itself that the track was built on was called by the native people, and I apologize in advance for butchering the pronunciation of this, the Hualu, which meant young man's initiation place. Motorcycle racing was popular there in its early years, which is where the first turn name comes from. It's called Hell Corner. Back when the motorcycles ran there, a tree stump sat in the middle of the apex of the corner. Obviously, if a rider were to hit that stump, chances of survival would deteriorate. And the legacy that began to establish was that if a driver were to hit that and die, it'd be their own folly, dooming them to an eternity of damnation. Hence, that's where Hell Corner comes from. 
So after that joyous corner begins the ascent up the intimidating mountain straight. It leads into Quarry Corner, named after a much less dramatic reason. There is a quarry outside the racetrack there, hence the naming. It sweeps into a short straight for the combination of corners called the Cutting occur. The track begins to narrow immensely here, as the grade of climb uphill exceeds into grade 6. It is scary to run through here single file, and the tri double file could end in an incident that would easily block the track. Once through the cutting, it's on to Griffin's Mount. This corner is named in a nod to Mayor Martin Griffin, the man behind creating the track. This corner is stealthy and how it can bite you. It is wide and sweeping compared to the previous Griffin's Bend, luring you into a false sense of security. Feeling as though you can make it through there quite easily, the corner is on a negative camber, meaning that it banks away from the center of the corner. It tricks you into your untimely demise into the outside barrier. Next is Reed Park, the beginning of a large sweeping left-hand corner. This is named after the man who redesigned the corner to make it safer and more suitable for motor racing, Huey Reed. This part of the track, while not seeming difficult, lays dirty, catching unaware drivers off in the biggest way possible. This leads into the center of the wide left-hand corner, Frog Hollow. And finally, on the exit of the wide sweeping left-hander is Solman Park. This is the peak of the mountain climb, the highest point on the entire circuit. The list of crashes that have occurred here is lengthy, mostly caused by the drastic dip before the quick incline to the treacherous corner. Solman Park is a nature park, which is where the normal name comes from, but it is also called Metal Grate Corner for a newer drainage grate that is on the exit of the corner. It is placed perfectly where the maximum corner exit load occurs throwing drivers off on a repeated occurrence. Now begins the decline in which speeds increase due to the aid of gravity. McPhillamy Park is next. Being a quick downhill left-hander, you have to convince yourself to run fast through here. As the center of the corner consists of a crest blinding drivers of what lays on the other side, the best way to run it is to get as close to the inside as physically possible, to not blow the corner exit. But on the inside of the corner, instead of a normal curb, it is a wall paying you for over-greediness with, instead of an off-track, a barrier impact. Continuing downhill is Skyline, a quick decline straight that leads into the S's of the course. Skyline is maybe the one moment where you can breathe at the top of the mountain and to look at the challenges that still lay ahead. You soon begin the S's, which may be the most iconic part of the course. Back and forth through tight, narrow corners like a street circuit, one of these corners is known as the Dipper which is reminiscent of the corkscrew at Laguna Seca. The imitation corkscrew has been modified various times for safety, as the decline is so severe that at one point you could pop two tires off the ground as you went over the elevation transition. All this eventually leads into Forest's elbow, which is the last corner for taking you on the Conrad Strait. This corner, while shaped like an elbow, isn't named for that reason. Motorcycle racer Jack Forrest took to the track in 1947 for track practice. He wiped out in this corner, and ground off the end of his elbow through the accident. The track was subsequently named Devil's Elbow, but the tease Jack for his misfortune, it was just named Forrest's Elbow. This corner is designed in such a way to almost try and throw you off track. But once you're through it, you're on to Conrad Strait. This is the fastest part of the entire track, reaching speeds near 200 miles an hour. The elevation down this strait goes up and down twice, giving you an unsteady feel even in a straight line. Many men have perished trying to conquer the mountain, and many of them occur on this straight alone. Therefore, in order to make the area safer, the biggest modification to the track was added in 1987. Probably my favorite part of the track, the chase. You whip your car through the chase trying your best to run it as fast as possible, almost like a straightaway. They place the chase where it is as a tribute, as in the exact place the year before they built it, Mike Bergman was killed in an accident. The chase still hasn't prevented the worst from happening, however. In 1994, Don Watson was killed when he lost his brakes and slammed into a tire barrier head-on after going straight through the chase. He didn't die in the impact, but he succumbed to his injuries later. You finally end the lap with a short straight and then a 90-degree corner called Murray's Corner. Bill Murray, who raced there in 1946, crashed coming through the final corner. Thus, it was named Murray's Corner. And then finally, you're back on the pit straight, completing a circuit around one of the most intimidating tracks in the world. As with any challenging course, the lap record is something held preciously in the subconscious of all drivers at the track. The green flag, the green car, and the man from Queensland, Dick Johnson, underway. This is the heavyweight of the race, the big falcon. Oh, the Queenslander puts the wheel out as he goes around Hell Corner. Enormous horsepower under the bonnet there. 
giant strides up Mountain Straight. Heading up to GTX Bend. Just listen, the 351 work. To the right-hander. The climb to the top of Mount Panorama. As Queensland's Dick Johnson goes after pole position. Big new wheels on the Falcon. Sits on the road so much better. A ton of power on the ground. And listen to the cheers of the crowd across the top of the mountain. As one of Australian motorsport's most popular drivers guns the big V8. Everybody's hero, Dick Johnson. Listen to the cheers. Across the top of the mountain in 115.8. If he keeps that up, I hate to think what the final lap time is. Oh, he's hit the fence oh. and he's gone off the track into a tree. Marshals and firemen racing to the scene where Johnson has gone off and either taken out cable or the camera. Took our camera cable, that's why we lost picture there just as he speared off the track. Dick Johnson in 1983 was on a run that would lock him in the history books. Possibly one of the greatest laps around Mount Panorama. But even the greatest drivers can fall climbing the mountain. Dick walked away from the crash somehow but his odyssey of a lap was stricken down by a thin guardrail in a thicket of trees. Through the 30 years after the crash, the record edged up in speed every year just slightly, one man after the other advancing it through track improvements and advances in technology. It wouldn't be till 2003, though, that we would see something as special as what Johnson was doing. Greg Murphy, like many race car drivers, found an infatuation with the sport from a young age. Across New Zealand, he raced until 1994, when he went to Australia and got his first opportunity with Brad Jones Racing. In a Toyota, Greg made his first attempt at the Bathurst 1000 with co-driver James Kay. They finished 23rd, 25 laps down. For 1995, Greg ran again and only made it 10 laps this time. That year's co-driver was Craig Loundis with which the two stayed together for 1996, and that turned out to be the right decision. They won the event, claiming victory over Dick Johnson and John Bow. Murphy would DNF the next three years in a row, but then would win again with Steve Richards in 1999. Murphy, by the turn of the century, had proven to be one of the best on the circuit. By 2003, he had partnered up with Rick Kelly and the Kmart team for a go at a third 1,000 win. In practice on Thursday, Murphy won both sessions, this fast time of 208.3282 was passed on Friday by Mark Skyf. In qualifying, Murphy did go fastest, barely over Skyf, to move into the final round of qualifying. It would be a 10-car shootout, each one making a one-lap run. Murphy would go out last, and he'd be trying to become the first Kiwi to actually win the pole for the event. Others from New Zealand had sat on it before, but the actual lap was achieved by their co-driver, with John Bow setting a 207.9556. Greg was going to have to do something amazing to beat the fastest time of the weekend. Scaife, Ambrose, the other guys haven't managed to do it. Now, Greg Murphy. In his words, there's never been a better feeling than what he did on the mountain in the qualifying when he posted a 207.95. A two-time winner here. 1996 with Craig Lowndes, in 1999 with Stephen Richards. It's a mammoth job ahead of him because that time of John Bowes will look as big as the mountain he's about to try and tame around Hell Corner. You see the wheel work from Greg on the way through one there and the car's very settled. He turns it in once, there's only a little bit of a trim of the steering wheel angle across the face of the corner and then nails the throttle on the way out. It's a very stable motor car, 51, and it has been all weekend. First in the first two practice sessions, first in the qualifying session. As I mentioned, an 0795. Through the cutting. 
he set the throttle in, you heard a little dab, tried to pick it up, had to come back out, got back on it again, squeezing, looking for every last thousand. Third to fourth, this is the run to Reed Park, he's up, and look at the split! It's awesome! Four tenths of a second for Greg Murphy! The readout on the dash won't show him that, but it's showing that the Kmart Commodore is top of the game right now. Four tenths inside John Bow's time. Gee, the car looks good and Murphy's really ringing this thing. He is getting 11 tenths out for state free so far. Every millimetre of road on the run to Forest Elbow. Second split's critical. Is it online at the elbow? A little bit wider than he would have liked, but he stays with it. I don't think it's hurt him. He's up nearly 0.7. An awesome time so far from Murphy. And the Holden fans in the background are roaring. His He's... time yesterday was a 27.95. Can he improve on it? JB. Well, He's all you the one can do most is laugh. interested at the moment. And all you can do is laugh because this is just quite simply an awesome lap. He holds it together through the chase. And Greg Murphy, listen to the crowd roar. The Holden supporters love it. He has released the shackles on car 51, and he is going straight to pole position for the Bob Jane T-Marts 1000. Murphy, a blistering lap. Holy smokes. That's a record breaker. That is insane. Absolutely bloody fantastic. Absolutely fantastic lap. Uncharted territory for anybody on the mountain. Nobody's ever gone under the sevens. <laughs> Take a bow, Greg Murphy. That was something very special in the history of Bathurst. <laughs> wow. He doesn't care about regulations. The belts are off. I tell you what, there'll be very few people in that pit lane that don't applaud this. That is an outstanding bit of driving and a beautiful motor car. A credit to Kmart Racing. And that, look at them, they've come out of the bunkers to applaud extraordinary work. Look at that, you will never see that at any other time in Australian motorsport. Standing ovation for Greg Murphy. Quite simply, the most incredible lap you're ever going to see.